Hello and welcome to another screencast with GD Life at Phuket Pulse. I'm teacher Alex and today we are going to looking at the GD science topic evolution, ev evidence for common descent. If this video helps you or if you need further help, feel free to contact us anytime or paste a comment below and we will get back to you. All right, let's get started. Quick overview of the topic. We will talk about the definitions of evolution and common descent. And then we will have a look at the different uh, forms of evidence that we have found over the past centuries, um, the past century, uh, that yeah, gives us as evidence for the theory of evolution and common descent. And these are um, anatomical features of organisms and species where species share similar physical features. Um, we will look, have a look at uh, molecular biology, um, the DNA and the genetic code that reflects uh, shared ancestry of life. And DNA comparisons can show how related species are. We will have a look at biogeographical patterns of species distribution um, and a little bit yeah, on island species and how this reflects evolution and geological change and how the two are connected with each other. We will have a look at the fossil records and how fossils document the existence of past species that are related to present day species. And um, we will have a look at uh, how we can directly observe evolution happening in the now usually with organisms uh, yeah, that have short life cycles like pesticide resistant insects or antibiotic resistant bacteria. So d definitions first. Evolution is a change in the genetic makeup and often the heritable features that can be passed on to the next generation of a population over time. Biologists sometimes define two types of evolution based on scale. First type is macroevolution, which refers to large scale changes that occur over very long time frames, such as the formation of new species and groups of organisms, which usually takes 10,000s or 100,000s or even millions of years. And microevolution which refers to small scale changes that affect just one or a few genes and these happen in populations over shorter time scales but usually not directly um, lead to the formation of a new species. Um, it is important to understand that there is no real difference between macroevolution and microevolution Many microevolutionary changes will, in the end, lead to macroevolutionary changes. So all these small-scale changes over time will add up, and then a larger genetic change between two populations may lead to the development of a new species. What does common descent mean? So um, common descent is a term within evolutionary biology which refers to the common ancestry of a particular group of organisms. Well, now we are stuck with the term common ancestry. So we really need to look at these two terms um, to fully understand what we are talking about here. We have them down here. These two terms are descendant and ancestor. So a descendant is a plant or an animal that is related to a particular plant or animal that lived long ago. Something that developed from another thing that was made or existed earlier. An ancestor is an early type of animal or plant from which others have evolved. A person typically one or more remote than a grandparent from whom one is descendant, for example. So. Um, descendant and ancestor relate to the two ends of our timeline here. Um, for example, you are the descendant of 
your parents, of your grandparents, of your great-grandparents. And your great-grandparents are your ancestors. So the ancestor is the organism in the past, and the, their descendants are the organisms that came after them. And the most recent descendants are the ones that live today, the organisms and species that live today. Common descendants uh, or common ancestry relates to two species that are alive today. If we go back in time and follow their family trees, at some point they will meet and they will have the same ancestor. And at that point, this is what we call their common ancestor, the ancestor they have in common. So the process of common descent involves the formation of new species from an ancestral population, from a common ancestor. When a recent common ancestor is shared between two organisms, they are said to be closely related. So if we don't have to go back in time too far, only a few 10,000 years or 100,000 years, but not millions of years. In contrast, common descent can also be traced back to a universal common ancestor of all living organisms using molecular method. Now, that is one of the central dogmas of the theory of evolution. That if we go far enough back in time, that all life originated from one common ancestor. We will have a look at that in more detail when we will talk about the molecular evidence of evolution and common descent. All right, what are homologous structures or homologies? Homologous structures are organs or skeletal elements of animals and organisms that are similar in structure and thus suggest their connection to a common ancestor. These structures do not have to look exactly the same or have the same function, but they usually have the same underlying organ or skeletal elements. Now we can see this on these two pictures, on these two examples here, where we have the four limbs of different species, of humans, dogs, birds, and whales, and bat here as well, porpoise, horse, and frog. So all these organisms um, are very different types of animals that use their forelimbs, their legs, in very different ways. But if we look beneath the surface, under the skin, and have a look at their bones, we can see that these bones are very similar. And these are called, then, these similar structures are homologies. And they are a result of common descent from a common ancestor of these species. So if we go far enough back in time, all these species we have here and even more, go back to a common ancestor that had eventually four limbs, four-legged animal, so-called tetrapod that lived around 365 million years ago. And this organism probably had similar bones that we find in all these organisms today. And this basic bone structure remained in all these organisms. The humerus, the radius, the ulna, the metacarpals and the phalanges can find these basic bones in all of these animals. Looking slightly different, being adapted to specific functions in their environment. And this is very good evidence for common descent and common ancestry. It is very important to not confuse homologous structures with analogous structures where homologous structures come from common ancestry, common ancestor that we share in the past, and are evidence for 
evolution and common descent. Analogous structures, in contrast, are similar structures in organisms due to convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is the process whereby organisms that are not closely related to each other at all independently evolve similar traits, like having wings, for example, as a result of having to adapt to similar environments or ecological niches. So different po similar parts of the world and different parts of the world as well, organisms face similar selection pressures, they face similar problems over the course of many, many, many generations, and eventually a structure evolves that solves that problem, like a wing allowing an organism to fly. Just having a wing doesn't mean that the organisms are closely related to each other. Look at the butterfly and the bird. Both have wings, but they one is an insect and the other is a vertebrate. They are not closely related to each other at all. So if we look at these structures here on the right side, we can see that well, the underlying bone structures in three of these organisms, in a bat, in a bird, and maybe I'm not sure what organism this is, maybe from a dinosaur um, that was able to fly, the bones maybe, yeah, the bones uh, underlying bone structure or homologous structures, but the surface that allows the organism to fly, the wing itself, these are analogies. Here we have leathery skin, the bat as well, bird, we have feathers that allow the bird to fly, and yeah, in a butterfly we have a completely different structure. So just having wings does not relate to a common ancestor. It is an analogous feature that came into existence in all these organisms because they adapted to similar environments and adapted due to similar selection pressures. Nature often comes up with similar solutions for the same problem. Another example would be sharks and whales or sharks and dolphins. They look quite similar, but you know, that both of them have fins, they are torpedo-shaped, but the underlying bone structure in their fins is different. Um, they both live underwater, they both are hunters, dolphins and sharks, so they evolved similar body structure to face these challenges of hunting prey underwater leading to similar body features. Again, an example of analogous structures. Here one more time, we have the homologous legs in mammals, a cat leg and a whale leg. How can we tell it's homologous? Because we have similar underlying bone structure. Same homologous legs of insects, of a praying mantis and a water boatman flipper leg, which is uh, probably a crab leg, uh, that a crab that lives in the water. We can again see that the underlying structure of this leg is similar, showing a common ancestry here. However, if we look at the function of these legs, the function of the cat leg and the praying mantis leg is similar, moving quickly towards its prey, maybe even jumping. Whereas the crab leg and the whale fin have a similar function as well. It's there to swim, to move through water. They have a large surface area that acts like a paddle. function is similar, they might even look to some extent similar, but leading to a common ancestor, they don't. They are a result of adapting to a similar environment. All right, 
molecular biology as evidence for common descent of all life. Like structural homologies of bones, for example, similarities between biological molecules can reflect shared evolutionary ancestry, having similar proteins, having similar genes. But at the most basic level, all living organisms share the same things. All living organisms have the same genetic material, DNA. It's the basis of all life. That's where our information is stored. They have the same or highly similar genetic codes. So our DNA always works the same. It encodes the information for proteins in the same way in all living things. We have the same basic processes of gene expression, how we get from a gene to a protein. You can learn more about this in another screencast. And same molecular building blocks such as amino acids for proteins. So all these very basic similarities in all organisms and not having organisms that are different than this allows us to come to the conclusion with all the other evidence for common ancestry of more closely related organisms that if we go far enough back in time, all life, all organisms on Earth today and in the past go back in a large family tree to a single starting point, the common ancestor of all living things. And we can have a look at homologous, homologous genes where biologists compare related genes found in different species to figure out how those species are evolutionarily related to one another. Well, the idea is that two species uh, have the same gene because they inherited it from a common ancestor. So in general, the more DNA differences in homologous genes between two species, the more distantly the species are related. So the more different their DNA is, the further back in time is their common ancestor. And the other way around. The more similar the DNA is, the more closely related the organisms are. For example, humans, cows, chickens, and chimpanzees all have a gene that encodes the hormone insulin to regulate blood sugar level. Because this gene was already present in their last common ancestor, all of them inherited it from this common ancestor. And we can come to the conclusion that human cows, chickens, and chimpanzees at some point in time share a common ancestor that had the hormone insulin or the gene for the hormone insulin. We can have a look at this gene itself and check how different this gene is between humans and chickens and cows and chimpanzees. And we find that if we compare the insulin gene of humans and chimpanzees, that it's about 98% identical. But if we compare the human and chicken insulin gene, there is only about a 64% match. And that's reflecting that humans and chimpanzees are more closely related than humans to chickens. Geographic distribution. How can we use biogeography to tell about common ancestry and common descent? So the geographic distribution of organisms on Earth follows patterns that are best explained by evolution in the combination with the movement of tectonic plates over geological timescales of millions of years. You can see on the right here the change of our planet Earth and the movement of the tectonic plates over the past 200 and around 250 million years. Now these are models, these are for sure not 100% accurate, but they are 
probably pretty close to what happened in the past. And we can see that the Earth went through many changes. It was connected to a mega continent called Pangaea, separated into two giant land masses, masses, Laurasia and Gondwana. And then later on, single continents split off and were isolated for a very, very long time. Like Australia, for example, still being isolated today from the rest of the continents. How this affects evolution, we will investigate now. So groupings of organisms that evolved before the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea, about 200 million years ago, tend to be distributed worldwide. Like four-limbed vertebrates, we find everywhere. This four-limbed vertebrate evolved around 365 million years ago. However, groupings that evolved after the breakup tend to appear uniquely in smaller regions on Earth because then there were water gaps, ocean gaps between them. And this is for sure for organisms very, very difficult to overcome. So we have a certain group of organisms evolving on one of the land masses and another group slowly changing and adapting on the other. For example, after Pangaea split into the two supercontinents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south, unique groups of plants and animals developed in the north and in the southern continents. Another example are the marsupials, the mammals that have a pouch, like kangaroos and koalas. The marsupials diverged from the placental mammals, which are the rest of the mammals that have a placenta and give birth to fully developed babies like the humans or elephants or giraffes or horses or dogs or placental mammals. So marsup mars the marsupial mammals derived from the, uh, diverged from the placental mammals about 90 million years ago and marsupials used to occur throughout the whole world, but now only inhabit a few regions. So the placentals took over. Uh, and around 90 million years ago, we can see that here, Australia and South America split off from the mainland masses and they stayed separated for the rest of these 90 million years. Just South America recently connected over a land bridge Central America to North America again. Uh, again, let's look at the split. Uh, it will come soon. Bup, 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 bup. No, now we can see, okay, Australia splits off, South America splits off, and they stay isolated. So the marsupials evolved here. There were no placental mammals on these continents, and the placental mammals slowly took over the rest of the world. So they were more successful than the marsupials. But they were not on Australia and South America, South America until very recently in the past few million years. So in our day's world we only find placent uh, only find marsupials, pouch, uh, mammals that have a pouch in Australia and in some parts of South and Central America. So this is how biogeography gives us some pieces of evidence for common descent and common ancestry. Next are the fossils. Fossils are the preserved remains of previously living organisms and species, or their traces, dating back to the distant past. And they offer a unique insight into long-term evolution, the macroevolution, how species changed over very long periods of time. Um, all the fossils that we found we call the fossil record and for sure this fossil record is um, a bit like a huge puzzle where we only have very very few pieces to the complete puzzle. It's very unlikely that an organism that dies becomes a fossil. So we are really picking and walking in the dark here but sometimes we find a little piece of evidence, a little puzzle piece and can add it to the big puzzle of the tree of life. 
and eventually find evidence for um, yeah, a past organism and how it relates to organisms that are alive today and eventually even gives us a link between organisms that are alive today um, in the form of this fossil being their common ancestor. So fossils document the existence of now extinct species showing that different organisms have lived on Earth during different periods of the planet's history and they can also help scientists to reconstruct the evolutionary histories of present-day species by linking some of them together uh, if a fossil shows um, similarities to both and eventually being something like a common ancestor. For example, the lineage of horses um, has an almost complete fossil record. And it's very well studied. Using these fossils, scientists have been able to reconstruct a large branching family tree for the horses family and their now extinct relatives. Now up here we can see some examples of fossils. We can see that it grew in size. The legs changed from having three toes to having a single hoof and the head and jaw changed as well. Okay, how can we directly observe evolution? We can observe it in a few cases, and we call this microevolution because it happens on short time scales. And yeah, this is direct evidence for evolution and can be directly observed, usually in organisms with yeah, very short lifespans and rapid generation cycles. Examples for this are bacteria evolving antibiotic resistances and insects evolving pesticide resistances. For example, here we see the Anopheles mosquito that um, was transmitting malaria and we tried to kill it with a pesticide um, called DDT. And DDT was sprayed and in the beginning it was very successful. Many, many mosquitoes were killed. However, there were a few mosquitoes that were resistant to DDT. These mosquitoes survived, they reproduced and they passed on their genes for the DDT resistance to their offspring. And nowadays, most populations of the Anopheles mosquitoes are entirely resistant to the pesticide and the pesticide can't kill them anymore. We see over a very short period of time, a few years, a few decades, that a species has changed from being able to be killed with that insecticide to now not being able to be killed by that insecticide. And we see the same uh, similar effects with antibiotics and bacteria on even much faster timescales. This can be on timescales over a few weeks. Um, a group of um, students and scientists uh, of the Harvard University have done a very interesting experiment. They had a Petri dish um, on which they grew bacteria and this Petri dish was divided into different zones with different concentrations of antibiotics. Antibiotics are substances that kill bacteria. The first area of the Petri dish had no antibiotics. Bacteria were able to grow here. Then we had a very low concentration of antibiotic and it got higher, 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 higher. At some point bacteria will have a mutation in their DNA evolve an antibiotic resistance and are able to grow into the area with low antibiotic concentration. Eventually we find more mutations and the bacteria are able to grow into the regions um, where if we would have started here all bacteria would have been immediately killed. So we see a relatively quick change 
over time in the bacteria population evolving an antibiotic resistance and effectively seeing a change in the population and species. And this looks like this. This is sped up extremely. So this will be several days or weeks. And we can see these spots on the borders where bacteria individually mutate and are able to grow into the next region. We can see these points where mutations happened and where bacteria were able to grow into the new region here in this tree. And this is something like a family tree. Certain lineages go extinct and cease to exist, but other lineages continue to thrive and even make it in the highest concentration of antibiotic. All right, these are the types of evidence that we have and that support the theory of evolution and common descent. To summarize them again, we have homolog homologous structures that provide evidence for common ancestry, while analogous structures show that similar selective pressures can produce similar adaptations. Sele similarities and differences among biological molecules, like in the DNA sequence of genes, can be used to determine how close species are related to each other and are evidence for a single common ancestor of all life on Earth. Biogeographical patterns provide clues about how species are related to each other and that evolution is closely linked to geographical changes and tectonic changes over geologic geological time scales. The fossil record provides a glimpse into the past and gives us information about what species existed at particular times of Earth's history and how they relate to species that are alive today. And some populations like those of microbes or some insects evolve over relatively short time periods which can be observed directly, which is very strong evidence for our theory of evolution and common descent. Before we finish, let's have a look at two, three, four questions. First question, a student conducted an experiment wherein she applied various pesticides to mosquitoes to see which ones survived and which ones died. To ensure she used uh, the proper scientific method, she sprayed 10 mosquitoes in each trial and recorded the ones that survived. After the first trial, she allowed the mosquitoes to reproduce and then re-sprayed 10 of the offspring with the pesticide. The data she collected is shown in the following table. Pesticide ABC, trial 1, trial 2, trial 3. Now we can see pesticide A is not very efficient at all in trial 1 almost all survived, but pesticide B and C seem to be more efficient, at least in the first generation. Pesticide B killed eight mosquitoes in the first generation, but in the second generation it only kill, killed four, in the third generation it only killed one. We see a similar trend for pesticide C. So this data describes what pheno ph phenomenon all the mosquitoes are dying because of exposure to all three pesticides. All the mosquitoes are surviving due to being resistant to all three pesticides. The mosquitoes are becoming resistant to the pesticide and passing on that resistance to their offspring who are able to survive in greater numbers. All three, all three pesticides have the same impact on mosquitoes during each trial and could all be assumed safe to be used students. Have a quick think about this. You can pause the video as well. The correct answer is number three. The mosquitoes 
from one generation to the next become more resistant because the ones that survive have a gene for resistance against the pesticide and they will pass on this gene eventually to their offspring in the next generation. What term best describes the relationship between these four limbs we can see on the right? They are analogous, they are embryological, they are homologous, they are heterologous. Have a quick think, the answer comes now. The correct answer is three, they are homologous. Again, very important not to confuse with analogous. Homologous structures are underlying structures that are similar in structure, like the underlying bones here. And this is evidence for a common ancestor. Analogous structures are structures we see in animals that have similar function and because of that they might look the same, but they have evolved due to convergent evolution, adapting to similar environments, nature finding the same kind of solution. Which of the following would best determine whether two animal species share a recent common ancestor? Both species have wings, we see habitat destruction, body size of the animals or their DNA sequence. The answer comes now. The correct answer is for their DNA sequence. Again, body size and having wings could be analogous structures, they don't have to be related to common ancestry. Checking the DNA sequence and comparing how identical the DNA is, is a very good way to figure out how closely related two organisms are. How do fossils support evolution? The same species disappears and reappears in the fossil record over time. Species in the fossil record are identical to now living species. The fossil record provides evidence that all organisms developed at the same time. The fossil record provides evidence that organisms changed over time. The correct answer is number four. The fossil record provides evidence that organisms changed over time. If we look at one species disappear but don't reappear again. Once a species is extinct, it is gone forever. All right, that was it from me today. Teacher Alex with Life at Phuket Pals. This was a screencast and lesson on evolution and the evidence for common descent. If you want to know more about evolution and natural selection, you can check out our other screencasts and lesson on more on the topic of evolution. Until then, have a great day and see you next time.